fourth chapter. Let's go there. Hallelujah. Ephesians, the fourth. Hallelujah. Oh, Jesus is good all the time. Hallelujah. Ephesians, the fourth chapter. And let's look at verse 8. You can see that's most of my book that I love reading because my Bible's falling apart. <laughs> it's like almost that's what I love to read just about all the time, right? Ephesians, the fourth chapter, verse 8. The Bible declares, wherefore, uh, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now, that he ascended is, what is it, but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth. He that ascended, verse 10, is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens and that he might fill all things. I want you to look at that word, fill all things, that he might fill all things. That means um, there's containing, there's containment that he wants to fill. It's like you and I, we, have, we want to fill a basket or something. That's what he wants to do. He wants to fill. The containment here is his ministry, Jesus. He wants to fill in you and to prosper you and to mature you so that you can be effective for his kingdom. Now notice this, the, the only people that have the right on earth or the only uh, being that has the right on earth is human beings. We're the only ones that have right on earth. Genesis says he gave us authority and dominion over all the things of the earth. So in other words, you are speaking spirits enclosed in a body. And so in other words, this is what he wants to do. He wants you to grow you in your spirit. Now your body physically it will will age in time. You know, it ages. It, 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 you know, you're born and you end up, you know, Lord Terry, you, you die, right? And so the spirit man never dies, but the spirit man grows. And notice this, the more the spirit man grows in you, yet evidently, yes, it will demonstrate outward, outward. Your demeanor, your attitude, the, the way you look, it's going gonna, it's gonna to demonstrate how your spirit's growing. And that's how we can tell. The Bible says that your eyes are the windows to your soul. So he didn't say the things behind the eyes. He says the eyes. So in other words, your eyes reflect what your spirit has. And so how many people know that, you know, when people, when your children are sick, you see their eyes are just so tired. You know that. That tells me that their body's sick. But their spirit now may be the opposite, right? But the thing that we have to understand is that it's that inward working that God wants to deal with, right? Now, notice what it says here. He says, and he gave. Look at that. He, Jesus, he gave. That means he offered. He put in place. The Greek word is didomai. I put in place. Jesus put in place. If I can say it this way, he put in place apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers, the fivefold ministry. These are the fivefold gifts here on earth. These gifts on earth are precious, special. These are God-giving. And to encourage you, if you have any of these gifts speaking to you, highly esteem them, respect them. Don't treat them like any other human being. Remember, they're a gift from Jesus. If, if you have hurt pastors before, ask God to forgive you. Have you hurt evangelists? Ask God to forgive you. Have you hurt apostles, teachers, prophets? Ask God to forgive you, forgive you, forgive you. Now that you know, see, revelation comes to those that get revelation of the Word of God, right? Now notice this. The job of these five are for the perfecting of the saints. Say it with me, perfecting of the saints. There's that word, perfect. Now, in, 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 in the vocabulary or in the understanding of perfection, sometimes we get to the point where we'll say, well, we, we can never be perfect. See, that's just it. You're using unscriptural thought, but God wants us perfect. That means there's never a perfect apple. There's never a perfect diamond. There's never a perfect baby. There's never a perfect car. There's never a perfect house. There's never a perfect. There's nothing perfected out there. But God says, I want the church to be perfected. Now, think about that. What an honor for God to say, I brought the fivefold gifts so that they can perfect the body of Christ. So really, you're in the house right now becoming more like God, becoming more like Jesus, right? And I can stand before you with all authority and all uh, knowing, uh, knowing that God stands behind what I say because I stand on his word. And his word said, the fivefold gift is to make them perfect. Look at your neighbor and says, boy, I'm growing up. 
I'm growing up. Amen. Hallelujah. Now notice what it says here. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry. Why do you want to be perfected? Well, for the work of the ministry. The work of the ministry. For the edifying of the body of Christ. Listen, work of ministry. There's so much to do in the world today. There's so much ministry. There's so much work to do in the ministry. But, but what it involves is the edifying of the body of Christ. I want everybody to see this for a moment. You are the body of Christ, and we need to edify each other. We need to build each other up by the word of God. Because see, this is the greatest family on this side of heaven is the body of Christ. The greatest family ever to live on this earth is the body of Christ. When you join a local church and you give your heart to Jesus Christ and you join a local church, that body is your family. That's the family that's going to be with you eternally. Maybe your mom and daddy don't serve the Lord. And if they, if they don't serve the Lord, then they're not going to be with you in heaven. So we have to understand something. On this side of heaven right now, it's us, the body of Christ, right? And the enemy would love to destroy the body. And that's where we have to grow up, understand how to pray, how to stand, how to war, right? But I want you to think about it. Uh, the work of the pastor or the fivefold ministry, it, it, it entails so much, but also the body, it entails so much. You guys have so much also to do. So that means in order for you to become affected for the things of God, we got to grow up. Well, pastor, that's why we pay you. No, 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 that's not my job. I've seen too many pastors go to the grave early. I buried many pastors going to grave early because they're doing everything, everything, everything and because nobody wants to do nothing in church. Nobody wants to help. And so he's doing it all. All we realize is it's not scriptural. It's the body that needs to do the work of the ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ, right? My job is to perfect you and train you the word of God. My job is to teach you the word of God, is to show you the way of the Lord, to show you that there is life in the word, there's power in the word. And that's what I love the most uh, of my ministry is to teach the word of God, right? Hallelujah, can you say amen? Now notice what it says, he says, he says, till we all come in the unity of the faith. Meaning when you come together, you're going to have to leave some luggage out. You're going to have to leave all that, uh, that stuff. Well, I don't like going there because so-and-so didn't take my hand. No, no, well, well, you got to leave that outside. Well, I don't like going to church because pastor just reads my mail every night. Well, I don't read your mail every night. God reads your mail. He knows everything about you. I may say things that I don't even know what I'm saying according to the, according to the natural, but when the Holy Spirit gets a hold of it, he knows what he's doing. Amen, hallelujah. And the Bible says, till we all come in the unity of the faith, of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto, again, look at it again, perfect man, neuter gender, perfect being, unto the measure of the statute of the fullness of Christ. So in other words, think about it. You and I have to grow to become the statute of Christ, the full measure of Christ. This is where uh, people say we can never be like Christ. Well, let me tell you, according to the word of God, he wants you to be like him. He wants you to grow up like him. For the Bible says in Romans, for we have the mind of the Lord. Think about it, the mind, the, the way we think, the way we talk, the way we reason, the way. See, the mind is the, the mind, the wills and the emotions. He wants us to be like that. And if we're people living on roller coaster emotions, I want you to recognize something. Get off the roller coaster of emotional ties and be strong in the Lord. You have to say, I'm strong in the Lord. When the devil messes with your emotions, you got to say, I'm strong in the Lord. And and don't give me and let's don't use excuses well you know it's i'm a woman and this is me or you know I, i'm going into this type of age in my life no 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 we live strong and long tell your neighbor we live strong and long hallelujah amen long we we're not meant to die early we're meant to live strong and long hallelujah amen and that's the plan of god for us right and so we talked about it last week about you know people that that say, well, he's getting old, he's losing his mind, you know, no, 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 no. We need to say, no, no, we have a sharp mind. Hallelujah, amen. Say with, say with me, pastor, has a sharp mind. Did you mean that? He has a mind of God. He has the mind of the Lord. Hallelujah, amen. Praise God. So in other words, listen to this. It says that we henceforth be no more, verse 14, that we henceforth be no more children, babies, immature, tossed to and fro, and cared about every wind of doctrine. Some translation says, leaving the baby in the wilderness or in the woods. Nobody will do that, right, to a child. But by the slight of men and the cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. We're living in a world today that there are many people that are deceiving one another. 
And it's sad to say that if we're not in the word that we can easily turn into that type of attitude. There's people today that are deceiving. There, there's churches today that, that are not in the word. They're into psychology, into philosophy. And what happens is, is there's not growth spiritually because they will not grow spiritually because the word of God is the only one that can grow them, right? Can you say amen? And notice this, verse 15, but speaking the truth in love that you may grow up unto him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Speaking in love that you may grow up. See, love speaks the truth. Can you say amen? Uh, 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 unloving words are not truthful words. If you want to hear the truth, God will speak to you. And most likely, listen to this. In this room, God is always changing us to become more like his son. So that means when we come into the house of God, the word of God goes in love, but truthful. And the truth shall set you free. It's the truth. That changes us. Now, if you're in here not wanting to change, not wanting the truth to change you, then can I tell you something personally? If you're here today not wanting to change, then there's nothing God can do for you. Right? Think, think about that. You have to be willing and obedient to eat of the fruit of what God gives you. Right? Say with me. I'm obedient. I'm, obedient. I'm hungry. I'm going to eat the word of God. Amen. Praise God. And so as some of you may have to go into open heart surgery. I'm just saying, if we need to, open heart surgery in the, in the spirit. Right? Say with me, amen. I love that when God comes and says, you know, there's something deep in your heart, Robert. And I got to get it out by the word. Would you let me do it? And I say, yes, sir. Do it. And he goes and just cuts open, gets that heart. That, that heart that is so hard gets it and starts working on that heart, starts working on the heart, puts it back in you, closes you up and says, okay, you're free, healed, delivered. And what do I do? I say, thank you, Lord. It feels so good. I love it, Lord, right? Amen. And this is what we're doing. Say with me, I'm growing up. I'm growing up. I'm growing up. I'm growing up. Amen. Let's start by looking at First Peter. First Peter, the second chapter. Verse 2, second chapter, verse 2. And uh, let's see what the word of God says. As newborn babies, 1 Peter 2, 2, as newborn babies desire the sincere milk of the word. Do you see that? 1 Peter 2, 2, 2. As newborn babies desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. So when you first get saved, get that word in you, get that milk in you, get that milk in you. See, the milk has to be the word that's going to grow you. Now notice this. Uh, if we never get the word when we first get saved, then we can never eat meat. Isn't it so? I mean, think about it. Mothers that have, that have children, you know that when, you, when they first were born, how you gave them milk, right? They, they wanted milk. You ever see a baby how they love the milk and they just go after it. They're just, they're just going after it. Maybe milk is dripping here. But they're going after it, going after it, going after it. The day will come that that child is going to need more. Amen. And the parent's responsibility is to prepare that child to receive the next type of meal. One day, that child's going to have steak, just like you and me, pork chops, or, or whatever. You know what I'm saying? Beef jerky. <laughs> deer meat. Oh, praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. You, you see what I'm saying? Y'all go, y'all look, look at me. Deer meat. Yeah, I got some deer meat. Hallelujah. Amen. And so, so I'm going to make, I'm going to try to make some tamales. Amen. But anyway, listen to this. Where did that come from? Amen. Is that my belly speaking? <laughs> Hallelujah. And so we have to understand something. Now, where was I going, sister? Me. I said meat, right? Meat, all right, yeah, meat, meat, okay. Okay, meat, yeah, meat, 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 meat. And so we, parents have to come to a, recon, a recognition in life that that child is going to have more meat. It's going to need something. The same way is in the house of God. When you became saved, born again, desire the milk so that you can grow. Don't, don't, don't expect to grow overnight. Just keep drinking that milk. Keep drinking that milk. Keep drinking that milk. Uh, God knows how to feed you. God knows how to feed you. And, and when he sees that you're drinking that milk, he knows exactly when to start cutting off that milk and start giving you some more 
food that you can grow by. He knows how to cut that off and give you more meat. Oh, I love that about God. Oh, God, he knows how to take care of us, right? But the thing that he wants us to do is to grow up so that he can give you meat of the word of God. He wants us to grow up, right? So in other words, the childish way of talking, the childish way of acting, I'm talking about spiritually, the childish way of just uh, of meditating, the childish way of reading has to be according to his desire so that we can grow. Right? Hallelujah. And so in other words, we have to be fully developed, if I may say it this way, fully developed unto maturity in the word of God. Can you say amen? amen. And let me tell you something. I'm going I'm to share something with you. You can get all the education you want in your mind to be effective in this land, but you can still be immature spiritually. Are you hearing me, church? You see what I'm saying? And let's look at this for a moment. Does your education, now notice this, I'm not speaking ill of education. I believe we should get education. But think about that. Don't let education rob you from the spiritual blessings of God. Too many people want to get educated, but they're, they're not growing spiritually. So, so their level is, is unbalanced, and they're growing mentally, growing through all the, the educational and all this area, all this area. But their spirit, man, is so slow and, and so young and mature. But I want you to think about it. If you become mature in the Word with the education that you have, God can use you in greater ways. Come on, church. Now your mission field becomes exactly your ministry with the education and with the word of God. Come on, church, can you say amen? I love it when I talk to doctors that are, that are well-trained doctors and they love the Lord. I, you know, I went to a church that had a lot of doctors and, and it's amazing how they talk when they go into surgery. They just lay hands on the person and say, Father, today give me wisdom. And, and it's so amazing that they have increased in the knowledge because of the spiritual plus the physical, right? Can you say amen? Hallelujah. Now let's look at something. Go with me to 1 Corinthians now. Jesus is good all the time. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Oh, Jesus is good. Jesus is good. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Listen to what it says in 1 first, first Corinthians, the 13th chapter. 13th chapter. I want you to look at it in verse 9. 13, verse 9. Amen. Now notice this. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. This is, this is a person that is talking about his understanding and the spiritual part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is part shall be done away with. So when perfection hits you, maturity hits you, now you no longer operate in part. Now you operate knowing things. And that's why it says, when I was a child, I spake as a child. Uh, that's, 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 that's interesting because I'm expecting my little babies or my grandbabies to speak like babies. I'm expecting that, but I'm not expecting adults to speak that way. And everybody says, right on, right? So in other words, the same way it is in the things of God. He says, he says uh, if you want to know in part, then don't grow up. How many people want to know all things? In fact, we're to say, I know all things. And let me encourage you, re, 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 erase and remove the, the thought of always saying, I don't know. I catch myself saying, I don't know. I found out that if I say, instead of saying, I don't know, I can say, I know. In faith, Jesus will show me. What are you doing? You're working on your vocabulary according to the word of God. I know. Because the Bible says, I can, Jesus says this, a Christian can do all things I can do all things. Say it with me. I can do all things. And so we have to recognize saying all things is simply saying by faith, I'm trusting God in this, the, that the natural I don't know, but according to the word, I can do it. Listen, that is where revelation comes to you. You'll have more understanding of the word of God. You, you'll understand. I, I remember Jason when he started, it's incredible. Jason, he started the EMT basics which is hard enough. Then he went to advanced EMT, and now he's working into paramedics. And, and, and then fire school, and then all kinds of other uh, uh, things. And I remember telling him, son, listen, you can do all things through Christ. I want you to say that when you're taking tests. I can do all things. I have the mind of the Lord. He went in there, and listen to this, listen to this. Out of 25 students, he was the top three. 
top three. And they said, man, you're sharp. He knew it wasn't him. He knew it was God. So therefore, it propelled him. It, it, it just propelled him to move higher and saying, I can do all things. I can do all things. I can do all things. And see, it's a great example to show us what God can do. When I was in the automotive business, I didn't go to school to learn how to work on cars. I didn't, know, I didn't go to school to learn how machinists, how to rebuild motors. I can do all things through Christ. I can do all things through Christ. I can do all things through Christ. And God elevated me to have my own machine shop, my own automotive center, my own body shop. Oh, Jesus, my own tow truck. Oh, he blessed me, blessed me, blessed me because I can do all things. And people say, how did you do that? God. Say with me, God can give me anything. Amen. Hallelujah. Now notice this. This is why. Now notice this. A mature person. Now think what I'm going to say here. A mature, a mature, excuse me. A mature person speaks only valuable words. Now think about it. He chooses, he chooses his words purposely. And notice this. This tells me, according to the word of God, that when I was a child, I spoke as a child. But now that I'm mature in the word, then I'm careful with my words. I'm careful what comes out of my mouth. The Bible says, even a fool is known by his much vocabulary, right? So I encourage us, I encourage us to recognize this, that when we speak, that's what lets you know where you are spiritually. Pastor, do I not talk? No, I'm just saying learn to, voca to use the vocabulary of the word of God. Use words in faith. Uh, you know, when you're standing in the Word, use the words of faith. Teach your children to use faith. Right now is a perfect time to teach your children faith now that Christmas is coming around the corner. Teach them. God can give you little, 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 little price, uh, what you want if you believe Jesus, right? Amen. And God will give you wisdom, right? So teach your children. Teach them how to use the Word of God. Work on their vocabulary. Remember, all of us were born into this world with a vocabulary, and that was the vocabulary of our parents. And if our parents were not spiritually in tune with the Word of God, then we talked like our parents. And listen to this. We're all growing that way. Listen to this. The first words that you said were the words that you heard Mama say, right? Or Papa said, right? And it's amazing. Uh, our little granddaughters, they'll say things that Teresa and Andrew say at home. So I'm saying, wow, wow, wow. And, and one day she said, I'm scared. I said, where'd you get that word from? I'm scared. Oh, mama said it. <laughs> Amen. You know, we, we use words like that. right? Oh, 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 I'm just going to, uh, you know what I'm talking about? You don't, I don't have to go over all the negative, right? You know what I'm talking about? All the negative words out there. Somebody give me a negative phrase right now, quickly. What's a negative phrase out there? I hate it, right? What else? What's another negative word out there? I'm going to die. Oh, I hear that a lot. What's another negative? I can't. What's another negative? Come on, church. You have to think about what you say all the time. <laughs> I don't want to. I can't have. I just don't like. I don't. I hate. Oh, come on, church. There's so much comes out of us even before church and after church. Amen. Catch yourself. Catch yourself. Catch yourself. Amen. I remember we used to go to a restaurant after church. We used to do those in the old days. Remember, but we used to go out to eat after church. The whole church would go somewhere to eat. And I remember my eyes would always look at the cheapest plate, the thing on the menu, the cheapest thing. I didn't look at the expensive. I looked at the cheapest thing. And I remember my wife said, honey, what you going to say? Honey, listen, you got to really... And the Lord said, uh oh, watch what you say. I said, honey, you can have anything you want. <laughs> Amen. You see, we had to work on it. I had to shift my eyes from the $3 to the $7. Amen. I'm looking for, I even, uh, has anybody ever asked the restaurants, what's on, what's on special today? You're not interested on the special. You're interested on the price. Come on, can you say amen? Am I in the right crowd? Amen. Now we learn to say, Jesus, thank you. You can supply all our needs. Amen. And God blesses you when you when you get out of fear into faith. Not that you're trying to break the bank or anything. Did I say break the bank? Did I say break the bank? Y'all didn't catch that, did you? Right? We're not supposed to say that. We have the bank. We own the bank. Amen. Hallelujah. All righty. Just want to make sure you got it, guys. Amen. Now notice this. So in other words, we have to choose right words. Choose your words right. And listen to this. Loose words, and listen to what I'm going to say. Loose words are a sign of immaturity. Are you with me, church? Loose words. Your words, remember, your words now become tools to fight the enemy. Your words now to become, are tools to use so that God can support your words. Listen to this. 
every word you say out of your mouth, according to the word of God, to the enemy and the demons and all the deaf angels, they recognize the word of the Lord coming out of your mouth. Come on, church. Angels do not operate uh, or hearken unto negative words. They hearken unto his words. So when I say his words, angels go and work on my behalf because it's the same words that God uses. Now, if we use death words like I hate or I can't, then Satan is glorified and his angels come to operate on your behalf that you can't, you won't, you'll never have it. Amen? So we have to operate. So in other words, loose words are a sign of immaturity. And this is where we have to work on. All of us have to work on it, right? Uh, and so we have to recognize it doesn't give us, gives us an excuse to vent. Don't vent if you're a born-again believer. Speak the word of God. Well, Pastor, I got to let my pressure out. No, you're not supposed to have that. You're supposed to give the word of the Lord. Say the word of the Lord. I have the mind of God. Instead of coming home and venting on your husband, venting on your wife, venting on your children, it's there, that, that's unexcusable. You have to use the word. Get your children and say, Honey, um, Daddy and Mama, come today. We pray, although you need, you need the word of God. You say, Let's pray in Jesus' name. Father, I thank you that I have the mind of the Lord. We're strong in the Lord. Amen, children. We're strong in the Lord. We're strong in the Lord. Come on. We're strong in the Lord. What are you doing? You're bringing the positive word of God to your family versus venting. Venting is a sign of immaturity, and also we recognize that chatting, chatting, how many people know what chatting is? Chatting, chatting, a lot of words, a lot of words, a lot of words, a lot of words, a lot of words. Let me tell you something. Speak a lot of words, you may loose, loosen a lot of negative words. Listen to this. Whenever you're dealing with something, let's say, financially, watch your mouth. Don't come and say, ah, oh, ah, oh, these bills, oh, these bills are killing me. Oh, oh, oh. No, watch your words. The best thing to do is get in that word. Knowing you got a problem financially, get in that word. But my God, to supply all my needs according to your riches by Christ Jesus. Amen. Your children are sick. Don't go. Or don't vent. Don't, 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 don't chat, chat, chat. Well, you know, it works. Well, you know, it is flu season. I mean, you know, children are getting sick. Really? Your children got sick? My children have diarrhea. What? Your children? Oh, really? Wow. You know, it, it's terrible, right? Uh-uh. Chatty, chatty, chatty. Get that word and say, no, 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 no. I cover my children in the blood of the Lamb. There's no sickness, no disease over my family. Why? Because, see, that word takes priority over the negative words. Come on, church. Right? See, see, this is maturity speaking. This is what God would want you to speak. See, he wants you to use the word. Say with me, amen. He wants you to use the word of God. So we have to operate with the word. Operate with the word. And, ladies and gentlemen, it comes by purposely training yourself every day. You're the only one that can do that. I can give you the word of God to prove to you what you need to do, but you're the only one that can purposely operate that way. You purposely have to operate that way. If you're a cursor, and we don't have in this in church or maybe on the internet, maybe you are. If you're a cursor, purposely work on those words. Catch those words are negative. If you're saying all those bad words, negate them. You have to purposely work on it. Amen? And so in every area of life, if you want to be out of debt, if you want to be... Uh, 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 in debt, then speak negative. If you want to be out of debt, speak the word of God. If you want to be healed, speak the word of God. How many people here want to be healed if you have a, if you're believing God for something? Speak the word of God. And don't let anything control you. And listen to this. Controlling is a sign that the enemy's trying to bring you down. And let me just say something. I know uh, this is going to uh, uh, maybe step on some toes, but I have to say this. I have to say this. I have to say it. I'm going to speak to you. Listen, if you have a bondage, either smoking, alcohol, cursing, looking at the internet or uh, pornography. It's a bondage. You need to break that. Listen to this. God can deliver you from that. Amen? God can deliver you. If you want to quit smoking, then purposely you have to say, Father, in the name of Jesus, I'm delivered while you're taking the smoke, the, la the cigarette. And you're saying, Father, I don't like this. I hate it. I hate it in Jesus' name. I hate it. Say it enough until one day you can look at that cigarette and say, Pfft. but if you keep saying, I just, I just love it. I love smoking. You'll never quit smoking. I'm talking about the same thing with drinking. Same thing with drinking. Come on, church. People say, you know, uh, who was it? Your mom, right? It Wednesday. She drank since what, what, what age? Right? Early 20s. She drank, 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 and the Lord delivered her. I'm going to tell you something. Only God could do that. Only God could do that, right? And we all have things in life. We all have things. That, you know, I was an angry person. I had to work on my anger purposely. Purposely, I would point when I shave in the morning or brush my teeth. I point at my body, at my body, and I say, "You are a man of God. You shall speak like the Word of God. I speak peace over you." Purposely, purposely, 
So when anger tries to come, remember not too long ago, a car blew his horn at me going out memorial, and I blew back, right? A car, blew, well, I cut in front of a truck, and he blew his horn, and I blew back. I, was, I didn't even think about it. He just, beep, beep. <laughs> it was just natural. Has anybody ever happened to you? I mean, uh, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, amen for those that are, uh, that, that are yeah. You know, a truck, I, I cut in front of a truck because Christine wanted some chickens. So I crossed over, and that truck went, beep. The first thing that came out of me is, be back to you. And, and the Christine said, where did that come from? Oh, Jesus, please forgive me, Lord. And so you know what I did? I said, in the, in the parking lot, I said, beep, 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 Lord. I love this heart. I love this heart, but I'll not do it for mean people, mean people. <laughs> hey, man, I was doing it. She was getting upset. Say, quick, blow the horn, quick, blow the horn. Well, I got to I gotta blow the horn. Hey, man, come on, can you say amen? Hey, man, we have to do that. So we have to realize that. Amen, can you say amen? Now, now let, 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 me, let me give you an illustration of a child. Have you ever seen a child when you give a balloon to a child? And then they see this balloon, and it's the whole world to them. And then the balloon takes off. And, and, and all of a sudden, you see their face, and you know it's coming. You know it's coming. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? It's amazing. Or that same child has, a, has an ice cream cone and a big double dip cone, and all of a sudden, it just falls on the floor. And you, you're, you're watching, the parents watching, and all of a sudden, they're going, and you're wet. You're ready. You're ready. A big wail of a shout's coming. A big a tear drinker's coming. <gasps> ah! <laughs> what does daddy and mama do? Uh, son, we're going to get you now. We're going to get you now. Listen to this. Listen to this. That is so true spiritually. Right? When things don't work out with you, then we become like that child. And then we blame God for everything. God, I don't understand why. You see what I'm saying? It's the same thing. It's the same thing. We have to understand something. The child's priority was in that balloon. The child's priority was in that ice cream. The child loved it. And listen to this. That priority is as a child. I'm sure if you dropped your ice cream, you just say, well, I just have to go get me another one. Or if you pop the balloon that you're taking home, you just go get another one, right? Listen to this, listen to this. That means the child's priority is different than your priority as a spiritual person. Spiritual person has different priorities. So let's talk about priorities for a while. What is our priorities as adults? What is our priority as speaking people that are spiritual in the things of God? What is our priority? Do you know something? Our priority as spiritual beings, now listen, church, you ready for this? Our priority as spiritual being is to learn how to grow spiritually. That's our priority. Look at your neighbor. That's my priority. See, see, you can go get you an ice cream. You can go buy your balloon. You can go do whatever. You can go buy your car, whatever. That's, that's, that's secondary priority. You know that? If I want to go to Chili's after lunch, that's my prerogative. That's what I want to do, right? No one says, you're not going to go there. No, I want to go there. So, but that's not my priority in life, trying to find a restaurant every Sunday. That's not my priority. My priority is not uh, what I'm going to wear, what I'm going to buy. Oh, I got to go shopping. Uh, uh, you see where I'm going? Hey, oh, oh, I got to have this. I got to have this. That's not your priority. Your priority is to be, first of all, strong in the Lord. My first priority is the things of God. Come on, church. Can you say amen? So in other words, uh, going back to the, the trivial things of a child, that's trivial. That's, that's, if I can say it this way, it's petty. It's irrelevant. It's frivolous. It's minor. It's insignificant. Has little weight. No importance. You know, when, when Sophia cries about something, to her, it's her priority. It means so much to her. But to me, it's like, okay, you know, Sophia, i just get you another one. You know, it's no big deal. You know, but let me tell you something. Spiritually, spiritually speaking, spiritually, in the house of God, we got people working on petty issues, on irrelevant issues, trivial issues, frivolous issues, minor issues, insignificant issues, little, little, little problems here, no importance. Uh, you, you see what I'm saying? In other words, we have to be careful where our priority is in the things of God. Come on, church. I come to church to learn from the Word of God. I'm not here to look at Brother Bo's shoes. <laughs> Amen. I, I, everybody look at Brother Bo's shoes. Amen. I'm not here to look at Sister Sinji's dress. Everybody look at her dress, right? That's not my job. That's not my job. Hey, listen, but, but if you come with no clothes, now, it'll be my job to tell you, go get some clothes, right? <laughs> but see, see, that's, that's, that's trivial to me. You know, although we look nice, I go like my suit. Ten-year-old suit, it still looks good, right? 
And so, see, that's not why you come to church. I mean, right? right? Nobody comes to church to, to see what, what I wear, right? You better not. Hallelujah. Amen. Come to church to know God is going to speak to me. Amen. Let me tell you something. In Christianity as a whole, as a whole, we got too many trivial things in the house of God. Can anybody, can anybody say amen? You can relate to that, right? We can relate to that. I was in a church years ago that, uh, you know, um, I'm the associate pastor, and we have some people cleaning up the church. And my job as a minister is to come out to make sure everything's looking good because I want the house of God to look sharp, right? And so I remember that these particular people, it was a huge building. They only vacuumed the front where, where the pastor preaches, but they didn't vacuum. They didn't vacuum in between the, the rows. And I found trash. I found things. And I remember calling them, hey, guys, come here. Can you guys uh, vacuum all the, all the chairs? Just vacuum all of them, okay? That's, that's adult, right? That's adult, right? Can you guys vacuum all the chairs? Oh, my God. It became a trivial thing. They got upset that I told them to vacuum the, the thing. They started talking that, well, if he wants to clean, he can clean it himself. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Well, we're leaving the church because he's making us work more. Oh, my God. Come on, church. Let's get adults. Let's become adults. Adults are speaking here. This is God's house. Let's bring the vacuum cleaners. Let's enjoy. Don't just do it for the pastor's sake up here because where the pastor says, but do it where the people sit. There's mud back there. Go clean it. Go clean it. Go clean it. And I'm trying to say it the nicest way I can. I'm trying to say it the nicest way I can. I don't know how to else to say it. I'm, I'm kicking myself thinking maybe that's the way I said it. But no, it's, it's you just talking to an adult, adult. But to them, their priority was different. You see what I'm saying? Their priority, they were children in big body. They couldn't understand there's a big picture. It's a picture because it's the house of God. How many people love the house of God? We love the house of God, right? They didn't see it. They only saw it. Well, they wanted to please pastor associate didn't we don't want to please you that's not the point that's not the point uh, in fact listen if you don't want to vacuum i will vacuum you see but people especially in the house of god operate that way do you see church where we where we are we have to grow up not that it's happening here no, no don't don't think that don't start thinking it's happening here no 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 i'm just saying we have to be careful in how we we have to put our priorities back in the things of god it's the things of God. You know, when we set up, it's the things of God. It's God that's going to touch Jennifer. It's, pa it's God that's going to touch Pastor. It's God that's going to touch us all. See, our priorities are to do it for him, not to do it for anybody else. I've had, I remember, and this is, this is quite interesting. I think I had to learn a lot of things so I can teach you in this area. I remember in them days, uh, people wore, guys wore long hair. And it's, it's, it's weird, but they had cutoffs, blue jean cutoffs. Have you, anybody ever had blue jean cutoffs when you were young? No? Well, I'm, I'm dating myself, but, but when I was in high school, that's what guys wore, cutoffs. Their jeans got old, they just cut them and go play basketball with cutoffs. And uh, I'm, I'm in my office, and, and it's Sunday morning, the ushers are doing a wonderful job, greeters in the house of God. And, and I step out of my office, as I normally do to greet people and come to my office, and there's this long-haired, bearded guy walking in shorts in church so we bumped and he was a new guy i never seen him before so I said, hey i said hey welcome to church and and i'm i go in because he's talking and the ushers listen to this the ushers did not allow in church they stopped him right before the church and said uh to the fact that you can't come in here unless you change well i'm in the pulpit already getting ready to start and i see the ushers talking to him and then i see him the guy's moving his head and they're saying something and then he goes like that, and then he's walking out the church. I jump off the pulpit while the church is going on. There's a door. I jump out, catch him, and he, he was walking, didn't have a car. I, I said, sir, uh, sir, come here. I'm an associate pastor. You're leaving? He says, yeah, they, they don't want me in church. I said, you come on back. I brought him through the door that I left and sat him in the front row. Right? Right? So we preached the message, and... He was crying, gave his life to Jesus that morning. Oh, he gave his life. When I got off to church, an usher said, Pastor, 
I'm out of here. I said, well, 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 why, why? You're not letting me do my job. I said, listen, that's what this job is all about. It's about people. You, you looked at his outward. God looked at his heart, right? He left, right? Two weeks later, his daughter was raped in Dallas. We had to go get, we had to go minister to the family. What happened? The door was open because immaturity affected him and he didn't see the responsibility. You see what I'm saying? And, and so we went to his house to minister to him. I mean, it was, we had to wait for his daughter to come back, uh, you know, and he cried, he cried, he cried, right? And see, the thing that I learned was, let's get our priorities right with God. Why do we come to church? Because I come to learn. I come to worship. Uh, you know, if, if Brother Jimmy doesn't sh- salute me, I'm not leaving church. If, if Sister doesn't smile at me, I'm not going back next Sunday. If Brother Bo looks me with that beard, I, I'm just, I don't trust him. I'm not going to church. <laughs> I'm not going to church. Sidney's always smiling and I feel intimidated. She's probably laughing at me what I'm, you know. You see, you see, trivial things, trivial things, trivial things the enemy does. And, and that's where the body of Christ is today. There's so many trivial things out there. Churches can't grow because of division of trivial issues. And see, this is where we have to realize we're no longer children now. We have a priority, and that's the things of God. Can you say amen? amen? So in other words, listen to this. Go with me to Luke, the fourth chapter. I want to show you something, and this is powerful. This is powerful. In other words, in other words, trivial, frivolous, irrelevant, frivolous, minor, insignificant things of no importance can hinder your growth. Think about that. Next time the enemy brings offense to you, break the stronghold of offense. Don't ever blame it on people. It's the enemy. Uh, too many people quarreling in the house of God for that issue, right? And, and the reason why I'm telling you is because we're learning the word of God, right? Now notice this. Jesus in Luke. Go with me to Luke. I want to show you something. Are you with me, church? Yeah. Hallelujah. Is this a good, isn't it? It's good. Oh, Jesus. He's teaching us. We're growing up. He's teaching us. Let me tell you why. As the church grows... There's going to be people coming in with, with luggages. Understand that. Oh, we can't tell the, the, the short people with short dresses not to come in. They, they're going to come in. The prostitute, the drug addict, people are going to come in. We're not expecting them to come in all clean. How people, Brother Bo, have you ever gone to fishing and got a fish and brought it in and looked at it and said, oh, it's all clean. I can put it on a fry pan. No. I've seen Bo get his knife out. And cut that belly open and pull all that stuff off and wash it water and say, now you can eat it. Woo, right, Bo? We put a lot of fish on the frying pan like that. Amen? And that's the way it is in the house of God. Now, notice this. Notice in Luke, the second chapter, Jesus. Say with me, I'm growing up like Jesus. And notice this. I'm going to tell you something here. This is powerful. Verse 52. Chapter 2, verse 52. Are you with me, church? And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. This proves to you that Jesus grew. Now notice this, God doesn't need growing up. God is God. He is big. But Jesus was born through a virgin, grew up just like you and me, learned things, but there was a gift on him, a calling from God, but yet he grew up. Now notice there's a lot of people say, well, pastor, that's Jesus. Whoa, 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 wait. Let's look at something. Go with me to verse chapter, uh, go with me to verse 42 now. Let's look at verse 42. Are you with me? Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. Now notice what it says. And when he was 12, how old? When Jesus was 12. They went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And when the days have fulfilled the days, as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem. And Joseph and his mother knew not that he stayed in Jerusalem. But they supposed that he went to be in company, family maybe. And they went a day's journey out the city and they sought him among their kinsfolk and their acquaintances. So now they're looking for Jesus, right? And when they found him not, they couldn't find Jesus. They found him not. They turned back to Jerusalem to seek him. And it came to pass that after three days, three-day journey, 
they found Jesus in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors. He was 12 years old, right? In the doctors, in the midst of the hearing of them and asking questions. And they, all that heard him, were astonished at his understanding and answers. And when they saw him, they were amazed and said, Mother, and his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou dwelt with us this way? Behold, our father and I have been sought, looking for you sorrowfully. This is what he says. And Jesus said unto them, How is it that you sought me? Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? This is a 12-year-old boy, ladies and gentlemen. Now listen to me. This is a 12-year-old boy that told his mama, Mama, don't worry about me. I'm about my father's business. A 12-year-old boy in church with the doctors and those of the Bible, of the Word, and they were talking, and they were, he was speaking, he was answering questions, and they were all amazed. A 12-year-old boy. Now, let me just notice this. Now, 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 now this is, remember, our Bible, the Bible is our example. It's, there's no excuse for a 12-year-old boy to be immature. That means a 12-year-old ought to know the word. So as a parent, I told my wife, as a parent, I'm so glad that we raised our children in church. They know the word. Now my grandbabies have to know the word. I'm not going to be, I'm not going to bring an excuse. Well, they're just still young. No, 12 years old is a good sign to let you know that Jesus grew in the word. He grew in the word. Now notice this. What did it say here? Come on, church. Look at it. Look at verse uh, 50, 56. And Jesus increased in wisdom at 12 years old. He kept increasing in wisdom and growing and in favor with God and man. Oh, Jesus. He's the greatest example to live by. Ladies and gentlemen, greatest example to live by. He was growing up. Now, in this room, uh, I'm 50 so-and-so. You're age 20 so-and-so, 30 so-and-so, whatever, whatever age you are, whatever age you are, 60, whatever age you may be, whatever your age you may be in here. Come on, church, whatever age you may be in here, right? And, and if so, you just got saved, it's great. Drink milk. Get in that word. Get milk. Drink milk. Drink milk. But if you've been saved more than five years in this house, 10 years in this house, 15 years in this house, 20 years in the house, then we have to operate as mature people in the word of God. Come on, church. Do you, see, do you see what we're talking about? You see. So in other words, does, grow, does immaturity, uh, let me ask you a question. Does immaturity affect the, the church's work? It does. Immaturity affects the church's work. Immaturity affects the working of the pastor. Do you know that? If pastor always has to do everything, then something's wrong with the growth. See, see, I tell pastors, I speak to pastors when we go, and, and there's churches, you know, I, I speak at a lot of churches. Here recently, I haven't because I've been pastoring here, but there'll come a time that I'll have to go preach too, and you guys will have to take care of the church. There's times that, you know, we're going in February to Houston, and I've got more speaking engagements than I can ever count, but the thing about that is, is, is when I talk to pastors, I encourage them, I encourage the body of Christ. I tell, in other words, I become a pastor's friend. I, I tell the members, members, your pastor's a gift to you. Operate, love him, honor him, help him get busy in the church. And then I'll get letters saying or emails saying, Pastor, it's amazing what people can do. Let me tell you, let me give you an example, right? Um, there was a church that the pastor was cutting the grass. Every, every, and it, it rains a lot in this particular city, so he was cutting the grass twice a week. And then he had to prepare a sermon, visit people, da, da, da. And, uh, and all of a sudden, I went to preach to this church, and, and not knowing, not knowing what he did, I used, the Holy Spirit used the example of, are you helping your pastor even cut grass? I didn't know, right? And I said, if, if the pastor's cutting grass here, then something's wrong here. You ought to line up and ask the pastor, I'll do it, I'll do it. And, and what happened was after church was over, man, the pastor had a line of guys and women just waiting to cut the grass. And not too long ago, well, now that he's not cutting grass now, he's saying, it's amazing, it's amazing. People, the church is so beautiful. We have people cutting the grass on Monday. We have people cutting the grass on Thursday. We have people edging. We, the flower beds, we have people that are coming to garden. Oh, my God, the church is beautiful. Why? The word of God came, brought change, and people grew up. Amen, church. Come on, church. You see, ministry is effective. It's, a, it's, it's effective. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. Amen. So in other words, uh, Jesus was growing up. He was being developed. 
He became our example. He, he had his priorities and interests. His interests and priorities were in the things of God. Mama, why do you seek me? I, I, I'm at my father's business. Now, let's just think about it for a moment. It took three days for, Jesus, for his parents to find him. I'm sure there were other children in this caravan. Because they traveled in caravans. Nobody traveled alone in the Bible days. It was too many thieves and robbers. So they walked and they, 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 they traveled in caravans. But I want you to think about it. There had to be other kids, right, sister? There had to be other kids playing. I can just imagine. Look at Jesus, Mary, and Joseph coming and a bunch of kids playing and probably throwing rocks at birds and probably have basketball, baskets, basketball, and playing with each other. You know what I'm talking about? Kids, kids are kids, kids are kids, kids are. I'm sure there was other 12 years old taking stuff from the little kids. Ah, it's mine. I'm sure there was 12 years old, 13 years old, 15 years old, poking fun at the little kids. I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm sure. But this Jesus, 12 years old, in the house of God. And the Bible says he was growing in the stature, growing in the wisdom. Growing in God. Oh, let it be said, our priorities, our priorities and our desire is to be more like God. Listen, church, our priorities ought to be of the house of God, the things of God. Remember, on this side of heaven, the greatest family that ever lived is the body of Christ. Our priorities ought to be the things of God. Amen, church? Come on, church. It's trivial, trivial things that, that are out there. Things that we're wasting our life on are trivial, trivial. Jesus Christ is going to come, and we're going to be with him. That's what counts. That's what counts, right? Now, let's look at Luke. Let's go to another one. Go with me to Philippians, right? Are you okay, guys? Amen. Hallelujah. I'm growing up. I'm growing up. Bo's growing up. Jennifer's growing up. Uh-oh, Bryce is growing up now. Uh-oh, okay. Hallelujah. All righty. Uh, let's look at Philippians, the, four, the, the second chapter now. Philippians, the second chapter. Look at verse 4. Everybody see verse 4, right? Look. Let me wait just for a moment. Is everybody, I want everybody to see this. I say put your beautiful eyeballs on it because I want you to see it. Mm. Beautiful rain going out there. Amen. Now notice what it says. Philippians, the second chapter, verse 4. Look not every man on his own thing but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Jesus Christ. So look at it this way. If you're going to think like Jesus, then the example is going to be you're thinking about how you can be a help to the body of Christ. Others. Tell me others. Others, right? Others, others, others. Now notice this. Notice this. Go with me all the way to verse 20 now. Are you with me, church? For I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your sake. Now this is Paul speaking to the church of Philippi. For I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your sake. For all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ. So in other words, at the church of Philippi, Paul was saying, which is, which is no different today in some churches, he's saying, you know, instead of helping each other out, nobody has the mind of the Lord. Everybody's just thinking about their own stuff. Look at that. For I have, I have known, verse 20, for I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your sake. In other words, naturally, 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 physically, nobody cares. In the natural, nobody cares. Ladies and gentlemen, when we get to the point where we don't care about people, like that usher that kicked that guy out, that he didn't have the mind of the Lord. When it becomes, well, we don't care. And, and I'll give you a good, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say something that I, I'm gonna, I want you to, in your core, to understand what I'm going to say. When you get a prayer request, now listen to this, when you get a prayer request, stop what you're doing and pray because that person may be entering into eternity. That's a person that's spiritual minded. But if we look, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, I'm just using an example. I mean, I, 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 I maybe I don't know, but I'm going to tell you something. I get people to text me that are critical. Fathers and mothers that are texting. They're needing they're needing prayer. They find out they found out that this church in Oklahoma will pray. And they've heard that we got over 200 something people pray. Now notice this. Notice this. When a text comes in, I don't know the person. 
they got they they got through some they got through a prayer chain and then they got to me all my prayer warriors have my phone number so they went through them it could maybe in idaho california where maybe and it comes through here and i'll get it i may be having breakfast with christine and i'll get a text say honey you gotta pray for phyllis or phil or bobby or oh man they're dying at that very moment i stop what i'm doing father I thank you, Lord, that your word says that I declare the word of the Lord over whoever. I declare the word of the Lord. I rebuke sickness. I take authority. Father, I thank you that you healed him in Jesus' name. What happens? At that very moment, God's at work. But listen to this. If we get a prayer request, we look at it and say, that tells me immaturity is there. Immaturity because they have no concept of reality of the things of God. You see, our first part, and I'm using an example as prayer request, our first, ex our first example is the things of God. First example, we get a call, we jump on it. We, we do the things of God, right? You get a call from your pastor, you get a call from your pastor about doing something. Remember, it's priority, it's priority, priority, priority. It's not, you know, it, it's not about having, wasting time. Oh, I would never bother you if it was just waste time. Uh, brother, brother, Darrell, I found a Batman book. Uh, uh, let's go read it. Uh, it's not about that. It's about Dario. Man, let's go do something. There's somebody needs some help right now. We jump on it. Why? Because see, the mind of Christ is to have the affection for humanity. Say it with me. It's not about me. It's not about my four. If you have four, it's about Jesus. Come on, church. We gotta, we gotta, we gotta look at it that way, right? Come on, church. Can we say it? So, in other words, in other words, immaturity is serious. I mean, uh, maturity is being serious, serious. Amen. Can you say hallelujah? Amen. I'm going to show you something. Go with me to. Uh, let's go to uh, Genesis, the 32nd chapter, uh, and we're going to close. But, but this is important. This is the part that I want. I want to show you something. Remember, I talked about loose words or, or no excuse. As a mature Christian, don't let. Be careful of your words. Use some strong words. Use careful words. Use the word of God. If you're having problems speaking words of faith, then purposely work on them, work on them, work on them, work on them. Can you say amen? Now notice what it says in Genesis, the 32nd chapter. I want you to see something. The Holy Spirit brought this out so powerful. Verses 27, verses 27. Look at this, look at this. Um, oh, Jesus. Well, let, let, tell you what, let, let me read, let me read to you um, 22, all right? Let's look at verse 22. All right, Genesis 32, verse 22. And he arose up, Jacob, and he arose up that night and took his two wives and his two women servants and his 11 sons and passed over the, the ford Jabbok. And he took them and sent them over the brook and sent them over that he had. And Jacob was left alone. Say it with me, alone. Jacob was left alone and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of day. This is powerful. A man wrestled with him. And he saw that he prevailed not against him. He touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. I'll get there, right? Verse 26, and he said, let me go. This particular person said, let me go, and I'll explain who it was. Let me go, for the day breaketh. And Jacob said, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. And he said... Listen to this. And he said unto him, What is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with man, and hast prevailed. Verse 29. And Jacob asked him and said, Tell me, I pray, what is your name? And he said, What? Wherefore is it that thou doest ask after my name? And he blessed him and left him there. Now everybody look at me for a moment. This is the angel of God wrestling with Jacob. This is the angel of God wrestling with Jacob. Jacob would not let the angel of God go till he said, you bless me. Now let me tell you something, that's powerful, right? That's powerful. So the angel said, let me go. He wouldn't. He had to, break, he had to pull his joint out of his hip. At that very moment, he fell to the ground. His hip was out of joint. And the angel said, from this moment on, your name is called Israel, Israel. But notice this, notice this. This is the key, this is the key. Are you with me, church? Immaturity asks wrong questions. 
maturity ask the right question. Are you with me? Just like a child, they ask silly things. Silly things. Well, who made God? Silly things. I understand. They're silly. They're little kids. I understand. Well, why, why, why did Jesus come? I mean, right now we're teaching our children Christmas. Why was he a baby? You, you see, you see they're, ch they're children, but listen to this. They're immature. So in other words, maturity doesn't ask foolish questions. Listen to this. Listen to this. This is, the key. This is what I want to ask you. Jacob asked the angel, what is your name? The answer was, don't ask me what my name is. What's more important is what I told you. See, what was the reason why Jacob wanted that person's name? Wrong reason, wrong question. You have God present your, himself to you. You're going to ask the right things to God. Right? Come on, church. Have you ever talked to somebody and you said the wrong thing? You just knew you said the wrong thing. You just go, so silly, I shouldn't say that. I asked, I'll I tell you what, I'll be frank with you. There was an altar call. I was not in the spirit of God. There was a woman that I thought she was pregnant, but she was just heavy. I said, sir, how far are you? Wrong question to ask. Are y'all with me? It happened, did it, did it happen to me? It happens to anybody. Wrong, wrong. I felt like, oh, where's the rock? Where's the rock? She looked at me like, I, I, didn't, I didn't know what to say. What would you say? Right? What would you say? Wrong question. Wrong question. I've learned now. Don't ask that question. Even if they're pregnant or not, don't ask it. Don't ask it. Amen. Don't ask a woman how old she is. I, I don't say it. I don't say it. I used to say, well, how old are you? They'll look at you like, I, I don't know. Why is it women don't like to tell their age? I don't understand that, bro. People ask me my age, and I tell them I'm 50. <laughs> Amen. You see, you see, 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 see. Immaturity asks the wrong questions. Now, likewise, in the things of God, we're asking God the wrong questions when we should know. Right? Why does God make people sick? Where'd you get that from? Why, why does God take away people's lives? Why do you ask that question? I've heard people say, well, you know, God took them. They're going to be angels with him. You know, you know, I know what they mean. They're implying politeness. But it's not scriptural. You die, you're not becoming an angel. Angels are already created, right? I heard people say, well, God, you know, <laughs> my mother-in-law, when she passed away, my sister-in-law said, well, God needed mama up there to pray. I felt like saying, you hush, that's not even scriptural. You see what I'm saying? You see, adults asking wrong questions. Mature people that should be mature in the word asking the wrong questions, right? Listen, when you know the word, and you study the word, and you hear the word, you'll ask the right questions with authority. Amen, church? Hallelujah. Amen. Well, if God loves us so much, why does he bring destruction? I had a person the other day question me with these tornadoes. Well, God sent them tornadoes to teach people a lesson. I said, what church do you go to? I didn't say that, but I thought it. Right? Right? See, people asking the wrong questions. Right? Now, I can, ex I can expect... Uh, Bryce to ask me silly questions because he's a child, right? Bryce, I love you, Bryce, right? You gonna get a present? Oh, he's mad at me right now. <laughs> he's mad. Somebody got after him, right? No, no, no. Listen, listen. And he can act that way. I mean, well, he shouldn't, not too long, but he, can you imagine you acting that way? <laughs> All piping, you know, no. Anyway, praise God. It's, ex it's expected. It's expected in our children, right? Hallelujah. But, but, just remember a scripture we learned? <laughs> remember a scripture we learned? Even children know right from wrong. Even children know right from wrong. Don't ever think your children, well, he don't know better. No, he knows according to the word of God. He knows, right? See, see, if we knew the word of God, we just have to know the word of God, right? Say with me, I'm growing up. Growing up. We're growing up. growing up. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, isn't it good? Hallelujah. Isn't it good? God is good. See, see, Jacob asked the wrong question to that angel. But the angel asked Jacob, What's your name? And the angel said, now your name is Israel. And do you know what Israel stands for? He who wrestled with God. Today, 
Hallelujah. Can you say amen? Let's stand up, church. Hallelujah. Amen. Isn't God so good? Hallelujah. Amen. We're growing up. I'm growing up. I'm growing up. I'm growing up. Oh, Jesus, I'm growing up. Hallelujah. And let me encourage you folks that there's purpose. I want you to think about it. There's purpose why God has us on this. There's purpose. Don't, don't lose the purpose. Don't think that, well, pastor sees us immature. No, no, no. That's not the purpose. Think about the purpose. Think about what God's going to get ready to do with us. Think about that. Oh, Jesus. I want you to dream with me. God is growing me up for a purpose. And it has to be ministry. It's not it has to do with, with working on my car. No, it's about ministry. It's about the things of God. Profession, education, with the things of God coming together for his glory. That's great. And if God's call you away from the profession into the things of God, that's great, right? God uses all of us for ministry, the ministry of reconciliation. But the devil, think about what the devil does. The devil takes from you, pulls you down, pulls your time, brings you down. You forget your priorities. But if we can focus on priorities, church, focus on priorities. Amen. Amen. Focus on priorities.